If you could speak to your parents today, what would you say to them? The Holocaust to me always been a very serious topic. Never forget that the Holocaust happened. To this day, which is 70 years, where I, I wake up sometimes in a sweat, remembering the picture of, of my mother being taken to the gas chamber. It shouldn't happen. There's no reason for it. You know, underneath it all, we are all the same. Every one of us. So it has to stop. The fact that somebody was capable of doing this is horrible and we need to be able to learn from it and make sure never to repeat it and make sure it doesn't ever happen again to anybody, not just the Jews, but to any religion or any ethnicity. There have been neo-Nazi rallies this year that have happened and nobody's done anything about it. Seeing that today, you would think it wouldn't happen. I myself am a minority in this country. I'm Hispanic. If somebody would have loved them, if somebody would have given them a feeling of warmth, of understanding of other human beings, um, I feel that they would not have grown up to be murderers and haters. It's very important to inform ourselves, not just ourselves, but future generations, to see the signs of when things like this happen, to notice when something can go terribly wrong. Just a little nervous. You're meeting someone who's dealt with a lot of trauma in their lives. You really can't put yourself in their shoes because what they've gone through was just absolutely, I mean, horrific. Just as a way of introduction, I've met a couple of you, but my name is Danny Reed. You all are now going to serve as witnesses to the witnesses. You are going to meet a survivor, engage with a survivor, do, you know, do research on the survivor and their experience, interview them. The end result of what you do is going to be a Holocaust documentary about a survivor. So you are going to be creating something that will be preserved for history because all the documentaries that you create are going to be archived and preserved. And we'll be able to use them for future, in future years here in Miami-Dade County as part of uh, Holocaust curriculum that we use. And what we're doing is amazing just because we're trying to preserve history and have it living on so everyone else, you know, and uh, future generations know what happened. I did not know anyone from the Holocaust. Um, that's why I decided to do this, um, to know people and know the stories and spread it out. One of the things that keeps them up at night, that worries them, is that when they're gone, that no one will be there to continue to tell their story. These people have a voice and they should be heard and that they should be spoken to as their name, not based on the number they have. You know, they should always be identified as a person because they're human beings like everyone else. The organization that the Holocaust Memorial is partnered with is called Names Not Numbers. Every single name was a whole universe and world unto themselves. But to me, the number six million it's the number one six million times. Names, not numbers, Bregman. I wanted the experience the, of this, for this project. The, uh, the camera work, the lighting. I wanted that experience from this project. And I feel that this being such a serious topic can really uh, drill in techniques and stuff that I could use if I really do want to pursue a career in film or journalism. Maybe I want to do documentaries after experiencing all this and getting to know these people and enjoying being able to tell their story in my own way. Today in the filmmaking class, I learned that you don't always need to zoom in with the camera you're using, you can have two set up. So I learned different um, camera angles for different situations and for different um, perspectives of a person. They showed me how also how to use like the focal points and stuff like that when you're trying to shoot something for a documentary. Today I learned how to make more professional shots like this. And I also learned a lot about lights because 
in our TV class, we didn't really focus that much on lights because we don't, we just use natural light. But now I learned about the three different lights, the key light, the fill light, and the headlight. Having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with a Holocaust survivor will make me feel, like give me a sense that I could be connected to history. Today we met with Julia Bagg from Channel 6 and she taught us different ways to interview a survivor. I really liked the session with Julia Bagg because she really gave us a lot of tips uh, when it comes to interviewing people. I feel like I already have a bond with you guys. If you don't know my name, Julia Bagg, um, I work for NBC6, but more important than that, uh, I went to South Miami Senior High. I was Diaz's student um, for four years. When you talk to people about difficult situations, it's really important to show that you're listening, that you're a good listening, and that you care about what they went through, um, that, you're, that you have empathy with them, that you treat them like a human being. And just try to put, literally try to put yourself in someone else's shoes. I think that what we can do is, is draw on maybe, and this is not easy, the worst thing that's ever happened to you. There's only one shot for an interview and you want to get it right the first time. The best answer you get is the first time you ask the question. I'm still feeling nervous to meet the, the survivors and interviewing them, but I think it's, it's a perfect opportunity to learn from it and just grow from there. I feel very anxious about the whole project, but I also feel optimistic in the sense that it will go well. I look forward mostly to working with uh, a team and a crew. I feel that communication between a team really does help and you know it doesn't only just help in the work environment but it does help in, in boosting up your confidence and your self-esteem on, on you know how to work with one another. I'm looking forward to hearing their stories and what went, what they went through. I will be interviewing Fred Mulbauer. I will be interviewing David. David uh, Mermelstein and Dr. Miriam Kasanoff. I will be interviewing David Mermelstein. I will also be interviewing Miriam, Dr. Miriam Klein Kasanoff. I will interview in Laszlo Selly. It's important for their experiences to be videoed and documented through film so we, we can hear their stories and voices. I'm looking forward to their experiences because it can teach me something that I, I didn't know about. I'm a bit nervous because David went through a lot throughout his life and I'm scared I might be able to bring back memories he doesn't want to relive. Good afternoon, my name is Sophie Howell. Thank you for coming to be interviewed for our Names Not Numbers project. So, first of all, what's your name? Good afternoon, thank you for having me. My name is Dr. Miriam Klein Kasanoff. My name is Fred Mulbauer. Uh, my name is David Mermelstein. My name is Laszlo Sally, but it was not always my name. Originally it was Schwartz, but after the Holocaust my father changed it, hoping to make it easier for us children. I was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1937. I lived with my parents. I was a little kid. I also had a twin brother. And uh, at that time, I still had my grandmother and grandfather alive. We had many other uh, relatives uh, living all over Budapest. I remember vaguely the time before the war, but 
life was easy and uh, fun for children. I was born in either 1936 or 1937. I don't have my original birth certificate. So I come from a very wonderful religious Orthodox family, Jewish Orthodox. Brilliant man, loving, caring, and someone that I looked up to all of my life. My memory is of a very happy childhood. And what I remember most since I was very young was having, oh, it was like a maid or governess named Maria, but she was German and was taken away from me uh, when the war started. Um, and I also remember every Friday night having a beautiful Shabbat dinner and my mother embracing the Shabbat candles like this saying the prayer, and having the entire Klein family at those dinners. I was born in Czechoslovakia on December 28, 1929. Uh, we had a traditional Jewish family, Orthodox. Uh, my father was a tailor, and I had a brother, and I had a sister. I enjoyed playing soccer, and I also enjoyed very much skiing. In the beginning of my schooling, I was going to public school. However, after a while, Jewish kids couldn't go to public school, so we had a Jewish school. Uh, at least in the Jewish school, we had no anti-Semites to beat us up, throwing stones at us, or something like that. So uh, in the Jewish school, we were all friends. When it was called Czechoslovakia then, now it's the Czech Republic. Well, it was a town, but uh, we had eight stores and two, I'll call them liquor stores, <laughs> a flour mill, a bakery. My father had a business in Europe. A person can just walk in in any store, buy tobacco, cigarettes, wine, whiskey. Had to be a special store for that. I had a large family, start over the grandparents in Europe. Grandparents were not, I call it, pushed out of the house. They stayed in the house that they built or they inherited until they died. And I had parents, two older brothers, me, a sister, and two younger brothers. And I'm the only one survived though. There was always anti-Semitism. <clears throat> the Jewish people couldn't even walk on the sidewalk. We had to walk on the gutter. And uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't shop uh, for food in, in, their, in their regular stores. We had to either grow our own food or, or we had to go to find the Jewish store. In the building where we used to live, uh, there was a little garden in the front and there was a sandbox and the children in the building, and my twin brother and, and uh, me, we used to play there together until one by one those children came to us and they said that they cannot play with us any longer because uh, their parents forbid them to play with Jews. We lived on a beautiful tree-lined avenue in Budapest. Our apartment building was right across the street from the Museum of Natural History which for us children was a beautiful, wonderful place to go and visit. Until the day we were going there one day, and there was a big sign out on the door saying Jews are not allowed. And I have never been in that building since. Before the war, when there was Czechoslovakia, I went to Czech school. Jews in Czech went to Czech school. Then there was a public school. There was no problem. My understanding is the relationship of the non-Jews and the Jews of Kosice was good because once there was a ghetto established in Kosice and my grandfather and the entire Klein family was in that ghetto, they had been told by their non-Jewish neighbors and friends 
that if they are ever able to get out of the ghetto to escape, that they would help them, which they ultimately did. Never heard an anti-Semitic word from anybody except the Hungarians when they came in. of Hitler in Germany what's going on but nobody ever thought it would come to us. The Czech was occupied by Germany. Slovak, the state of the Slovakia was friendly to the Germans so they made them independent. So the Carpathian they gave to Hungary and they followed the Nuremberg laws. A Jew couldn't be in business had to wear a yellow star of David. We couldn't own a radio, we couldn't read a paper, so we only heard rumors. But the rumors came from Poland, because the Polish, uh, the Holocaust started much earlier in, in Poland. So we, people came over the, the, the border and they were telling us stories. And some people that didn't even believe them, but they were telling the truth. Budapest did not really have a walled in ghetto although Budapest has and had a Jewish area, they simply took some buildings, painted a yellow star in front of the building, and they became designated Jewish houses that the Jews had to move into. But trying to move out of our house and move over there, we couldn't carry anything except what we could do in our two hands. So the only thing we took is our bedding, uh, our pillows and, and blankets, and uh, I remember moving out of the apartment, getting out of there and looking back and our neighbors were rushing in to the apartment, grabbing whatever they could. There was a knock on our door, middle of the night, and my father opened the door and there were about seven or eight uh, Nazi soldiers and they said, you have 15 minutes to get ready. And sure enough, 15 minutes later, they were there and they started marching us down the street and uh, I just happened to turn around to look at my house for the last time and what I saw made me sick to my stomach. We had all these neighbors who my mother used to cook for them and treat them well and they are the people who were celebrating our departure and they were taking all the furniture uh, and, and our clothing, our bedding out of our apartment. They were, and they were, and some people were moving in already. And we had to watch as other buildings around us got emptied out, people got lined up on the streets and, and uh, they hit them with clubs and with whips and they had dogs. <laughs> and of course, uh, the Nazis had the guns and uh, they marched them away. The Hungarian fascist police established on the request of the Nazis forced Hungarian labor camps. They were the precursor to what you today, students and everyone knows as concentration camps. But they were work labor camps. And my father, being a, a rabbi in the community, was immediately taken in early 1940 to one of those forced labor camps along with his father, my grandfather. They took my father to slave labor for a year only. Then they took the younger ones until uh, 1944 when they came one day. So they took by the thousand to the river, tied up their legs and shot them so they could fall into the water. The next day, they started to arrest people and take them to the ghetto. My parents got a hold of some papers from a Swedish diplomat by the name of Raoul Wallenberg. And this diplomat tried to save as many Jews in Hungary as he could and gave us Swedish uh, citizenships. Just a piece of paper saying that uh, we are now Swedish citizens. 
and he also had different houses where he put a plaque in front and, and it became a Swedish diplomatic uh, property. And he took us over there and we stayed in that uh, house and uh, conditions weren't any better. They were still crowded in there as many people as, as, as you can to a little miserable apartment. But we were hoping that perhaps the Germans uh, or the Nazis would recognize that it's Swedish property. Well, for a while they did not for long because whether you were a Swedish Jew or Hungarian Jew or any other kind of Jew, uh, it didn't really matter. You were a Jew and, uh, you know, they, they were ready to kill you. I remember one day Budapest was very heavily bombed at that time. That uh, after a bombing raid, a horse got killed on our street by shrapnel and the people ran out from their buildings and butchered up this, this animal right there on the street. And that night, we had a little piece of meat, which we haven't had for many a month. My father went to a camp, and he was at hard labor, but miraculously, he escaped. So he said to my mother, if we don't leave now, I will have to go back, and there's word in the camp that they're going to murder all the Jews of Europe. So we have to leave now. And my mother said, okay, I'm ready. She took me and my infant brother, Tibor, and tried to get my mother's twin sister, my Aunt Lily, to go with us. But Lily had two little girls of her own, and the last words that I do remember her saying to my mother when my mother said, Lily, we have to leave, we have to leave, was, I'm not going with you. I'm not taking that chance. And what will happen to me on the, here will most likely happen to you on the road. And so we began our journey in December 1940, the four of us. I never saw my Aunt Lily again. One night when it was very dark outside, I remember that we were running, running, running to get on a train. And suddenly my mother must have lost my father. And I remember my mother screaming, Moritz, Moritz, where are you? Where are you? And I remember being, as a four-year-old child, so scared that I'd lost my dad. But we found each other miraculously, and then we continued the trip. My mother told me later as an adult that had she had the opportunity to give us away to someone, she would have done that just so we could be saved, which affected me tremendously when she told me that because I couldn't imagine growing up not being my mother's daughter. I still get emotional when I think of that. They took us by train to a dilapidated brick factory which only had a roof. It didn't have walls, it didn't have windows, didn't have a door, and that was the ghetto. The ghetto, they, they took one factory that was owned by Jews. They were making bricks for the roofs, and when we got there, there was no room. So they took us to a farm that was owned by a Jew and chased out the cows and horses and put us in into those barracks. They made an announcement. Anybody that, especially the ladies, but anybody that has any gold or foreign currency to bring it here because we're going to check. If we catch anybody with any of this, we'll be shot. After the ghettos, we were taken again uh, to the railroad station, and I kept looking for, for the train, and there was no train. What I saw was cattle cars, freight trains, and I, I didn't believe they were going to put us in those things. Sure enough, they put in 100 people in each car, which you couldn't, you couldn't even stand, let alone sit down, for being so cramped. They took us uh, to the cattle car, 
and filled up the wagon. Family stayed together and they put in two buckets, a bucket of water on the right and a bucket for facilities on the left. We didn't know how long this trip is going to take. I think the water, the drinking water was consumed, I would say the first two, three hours. And the bucket for sanitary purposes overflew perhaps a hundred times. We had to use it together with the women, with the children. There was no, there was no privately, privately at all. And very crowded and very, very sticky. And the, and the, and the uh, smell was awful. We didn't know where we're going. We didn't know how long it's going to last. And it was dark, so we didn't know day or night. Train stopped. We got off the train. Men and boys to line up to the right, women and children to the left. When we arrived to Auschwitz, the doors opened up and the German soldiers jumped on the, on the car and started yelling, out, out. And every German soldier had, on one hand, he had a whip, and on the other hand, he had a, a leash for a German shepherd dog. And if, if, he, they, if he didn't move fast enough, um, they either hit you with a whip or the dog bites you. This is where my mother made a big mistake. Or I don't know if it was a mistake or not. Um, next to us was sitting a, was sitting a lady uh, with three small children. I think the oldest may have been five years old, four years old. And when they started, you know, having you know the dogs bite and they were hitting you with a with a with a, um, a whip, uh, my mother says to this lady, "Lady, I don't think you could handle three children. Why don't you give me one of the children and I'm going to carry it?" Sure enough. As soon as we got out of the train, my mother was picked right away to go left, to go to, uh, to the gas chamber, due to the fact that she was carrying a small child. Every mother who, was, who had a small child went directly to the gas chamber. Then we started to walk to the front. There was a stage where a Dr. Mengele was staying. He had on gloves and a little stick. We had uh, a selection. It was Dr. Mengele who was staying in line, men were staying in line, women were staying in line separately. My line came and he looked and I saw him motioned to our left. My grandfather, parents, two younger boys, brothers and a sister went to the left. This Dr. Mengele played God. He was just showing left or right. Right was the work, left was her guest chamber. And then I looked, my two brothers, I go on to the right and they call me and I stopped and I was thinking, shall I go with my parents or shall I go with my brothers? But I saw an SS guy come from the right with a, they had rubber hose because I stopped. So I just ran by that uh, doctor and him too and ran to the right. Uh, Dr. Mengele was a very elegant, elegant person. He had boots, they were so shiny, you could see your face in it. And he was always wearing white gloves and always had a riding stick. He was clean shaven. He was extremely, extremely elegant and very mean, very mean. Why I picked the right, I don't even know. But I just ran to the right and there was a, a trustee. Lucky that he was Jewish because they had Polish and Ukrainians, and they were tough. And as I was coming, and he looked at me, he says, how old are you in Jewish? I said, 15. He said, no, no, you hear? Tell him 17, and stretch out, and look tall, pinch yourself, go in line fast. So I couldn't figure out what that meant, but I went in line. And I went between my two brothers and I stepped on their shoes. Like he said, uh, to look tall. Stepped on the two shoes and I pinched myself. What happens when you pinch yourself, you get red like. And that's what he, we figured out, that's what he wanted. We only had a 
took us in a room, took everything away from us, gave us a cap, a striped shirt, and a pair of pants. That lovely uniform, the striped uniform, which in, this, in the winter, we froze to that. The shoes is the only thing we kept our own. And we had nothing underneath, no underwear, no socks. And we had a big number. That's the only clothes we ever got, we, we had. They took us in to a barrack. There were beds, but only boards and a piece of a blanket. And the next morning, when they told us there'll be roll call, so we got up, went outside, and right behind the fence were the people that were in that barrack, and the next one. They were there already a while. So they told us what really happened to the people that went to the left and we smelled. We didn't know what at that time. But the crematoriums were right there. So those that went to the left and straight to the crematoriums. While I was in Auschwitz, I, they gave me a job. The job was not a very pleasant one, but I will explain. When all these people went to the gas chamber, they were told that they're gonna take a shower. They were asked to, to undress. They told them, and when you, after you, you finish with, uh, with the shower, you can come back and take your clothes. Of course, they never came back because they were gassed. My job was to go into this room and take the clothes out and put them in boxes. So every 15 minutes, I had to go in because this is how fast they worked, how fast people were gassed. And I knew a bunch of people were sent to, to, the, to the gas chamber. They counted every morning before we went out, counted when we came back and we went out to work. I was working another three months. I woke up one morning and I had a temperature and walked halfway and I collapsed. So they dragged me in and took me to the hospital and there were already three people in that single bed People were dying. They just threw them out of the window and the gas chamber was right there. And they fed us in the morning like a Cuban cup of coffee. At lunch, a little bigger cup, about this big. We were lucky we found a potato peel in the water. I was already a, a, like a skeleton. We couldn't walk no more then, just pulled ourselves. Well, we went through Spain, we went through Italy, we went through France, we went through Yugoslavia. We were a, really a family on the run. My mother had another sister named Bessie, not the twin, Lily. So my Aunt Bessie had gotten a synagogue, a temple in Chicago to write a letter that they would sponsor the Klein family. And those papers were then sent to an organization called the Hayas that was situated in New York that was helping Jews get out of Europe. They were based in France until France was taken by the Nazis. Then the office was over at, went over to Lisbon. We had to be in Lisbon by March because there were reservations made by the Hayas organization for us to get on that ship. What happened was when we got to Spain, they didn't want to offend the Nazis, so they held Jews up. They held us up in a hotel because we seemed to not have some proper papers to get into Lisbon. My dad met a German tourist who was not a Nazi and he was very sympathetic to our cause. So he said to my dad, you know what? If you dictate a letter to me, I will write it for you and we'll try to get it to the Lisbon authorities that you're stuck here in this hotel with two small children and that you need to get into Lisbon. And my dad did that, and it worked. Basically, had he not written that letter for us to help us get out and into Lisbon, we would have been sent back to Czechoslovakia, and we would have ultimately ended up in Auschwitz, as did every Jew of Kosice. Uh, we were one of the few families 
that historically was able to get out uh, from Europe in the very early years and be able to be out in the open, in hiding in the open on the run. Many were hidden by Catholics, many were hidden by farmers, but there were a few of us, such as myself, who were able to make this dangerous, risky trip all the way from Czechoslovakia through seven or eight countries, and uh, we did make it to Lisbon. However, when we got to Lisbon, we missed the NASA ship that we had reservations for. We got there a little too late. Our goal and my father's was to figure out what do we do, how do we get to the consul offices in Lisbon to let them know that we're there, we missed the ship, and now we need transportation, another visa, more papers to get out of Europe quickly. When we arrived there, uh, there were about a thousand Jewish people in the Lisbon community. Uh, many of them were government clerks and they were extremely helpful. We were put in um, like shelters, little hotels to wait for our ships. Every day my father and mother would tell me to stay in the room, take care of my baby brother, and they were going to stand in long lines at the consul's office in Portugal to see when the next ship was coming that would help us get out. We were there for about six weeks until the next ship came. The ship finally arrived for us and it was called the Ciudad de Sevilla. Finally, we were boarded on the ship. We were transferred from Auschwitz to another camp, like a labor camp, mm -hmm. and the commander, he had to have somebody in the morning to beat up. I mean, that was his breakfast or whatever you want to call. Every morning he picked somebody out from the line and beat him for 15 minutes. When um, they took my father away, I was all alone. I had nobody to talk to because it so happened when they transferred us, they transferred me to a camp where it were all Greek Jews, Greek Jews, and, I, and I, I didn't speak their language, and they didn't speak my language. But um, I noticed there was a boy about my age. He seemed to have been himself, too, without parents. And even though we, did, we couldn't talk to each other, but we, came, we became friends. He, one night he says to me that I, shouldn't, I should follow him. You are, you are not allowed to, to go out even from the barrack, let alone out of the camp because they had those, those uh, lights where they were shining on you. And if you see somebody walking at night outside of the barracks, you were shot. He taught me how to, how to lay down when the lights come. And I didn't know what he was, he was taking me, but he took me to, he knew where the garbage cans were. And we always found goodies, a lot of good goodies in the garbage can. We found a peel, but the peels of potatoes, and, and, the, and the food, the Germans didn't need it throughout. So he showed me how to get some extra food. This happened for uh, you know, a, couple of, a couple of times, three or four times. Finally, one day, I came back from, we came back from work. He says, we're going tonight. You know, the way we had my, our own sign language. And we, we went, and I said to him, I can't go. I had a cold like I have now. He says, I have to go, I'll go myself. And I said to him, please don't go. You can't be the bear by yourself because you have to watch the light. And uh, he says, no, I'll take care of myself. Sure enough, uh, while, I, while he was out and I was sitting on pins and needles, worried about him, and, uh, uh, and I hear a shot. And I says, please, God, don't let it be him. Sure enough. He, he got caught into the light, and he was shot. So I cried day and night. I says, I lost my father, I lost my mother, now I lost my best friend. I, I, I even started talking to God. I says, God, what kind of crime did I commit that I'm being punished so much? 
I'm only 14 years old. The Hungarian Nazis took over. And uh, in the building where we lived, we mercilessly couldn't see this, but we could clearly, clearly hear it. They took the Jews out from protected houses and the uh, designated Jewish houses, marched them out to the river Danube, which is a beautiful river running right through the middle of Budapest, lined them up on the banks of the Danube and shot them. I remember the cries and, and I remember the screams of the people as, as they realized what was about to happen. I remember the orders being barked. I remember the machine gun fire. And then I remember the silence. And we realized that they were all dead. As the war was coming to an end, uh, it was, I think it was December of 1944. They were gonna take us to another camp. And, but the only thing is that they didn't have any more trains. So they decided to have a, ma a bad march. December was, is very cold in Germany. It was, and we had to, uh, we started off with about 125,000 people. If you, you just stayed behind a little bit, you were shot immediately. And people died from cold, people died from starvation. By the time we arrived to a destination, we, we lost about 100,000 people on, our, on, our, on the trip. For 18 days we were marching, 18 days at night, we slept outside, and while it was snowing, when we arrived to our destination, our troubles only began. We arrived to Bergen-Belsen. Bergen-Belsen was the camp where Anne Frank was, and she died there. Well, she died of typhus. The minute you entered that camp, you were, you were, you were contracted that same sickness. And, and when you have typhus, you become a zombie. You can walk. You can think this was just a month or so prior to the end of the war. So what the Germans did, they, they stopped all the services in that camp. They didn't bring in any food. They didn't bring any water. And there were so many dead bodies laying around that you couldn't even go to sleep in the barracks because the bodies were all, all, all over. And we had to shovel away, not shovel, but take away the snow and so you could pick the grass and we should eat it. The next morning, we wake up, no lights, no soldiers. So after a while, some of them hollered, well, let's go out and see what it is. We couldn't even get up couldn't pick up my hand or feet. So the people in the first room went out and they came back. The gates are open, there are no Germans. They see tanks coming in. So they started to get closer. They came in singing, dancing. It's Americans, I see the American flag. What are we gonna do? We are gonna die here. I said, nobody will know we're here. So we just rolled off the bed and fell on the floor. It wasn't too far, but still. We felt it, so we pulled with the fingers and pushed with a leg. We estimated it took us two, three hours to get outside. And we sat in this, this house and we knew that our time will be coming, that sooner or later they're going to come and they're going to get us. And then, then one day they did come. And they came into the building and they told us that next morning, very early, we all have to be lined up in front of the building. And anybody who stays behind will be shot on the spot. And we knew, we knew where they're going to take us. And that night, that was the worst night of my life. I remember all the women were crying hugging their children. The men were huddled together in a bunch, praying. I remember that we were hoping that morning would never come. But of course it did. And that morning we heard very early 
rifle butts banging on the front door and the door had to be opened up and there were two Russian soldiers, Soviet soldiers, looking for Germans. Soviet army took our street that night. They, they fought from street to street practically in Budapest. And had they came one day later, I would not be here to tell the story. I, I, I was sure I was, I was just waiting to die. I kept playing on the ground and I closed my eyes and I could feel that a car came alongside me, a jeep with a British soldier. And the British soldier picked me up like you, like you pick up a, a, little, a little toy doll or something. I was, so, I was so skinny. So he picked me up and put me on the jeep and as he put me in the Jeep, I blacked out again. I was blacked out for two weeks. They took me to a hospital, and when I woke up, uh, everybody, everything was white, the white bedding, and, and, and beautiful ladies with white uniforms. I said to myself, thank God I, I got it. I, I'm, I'm in heaven, and these ladies are my angels. But this, unfortunately, it wasn't the case. Um, they told me I'm in the hospital, and they told me I'm very, very sick, and they don't know if I'm going to survive. I was in a hospital for two years. I had my father's brother, who lived in America for many, many years. He was willing to uh, sponsor us. So my uh, twin brother and me, we came to the United States. We never saw the ocean before. We came on this ship in a tremendous storm. I remember that everybody was sick, everybody was throwing up. We uh, went to bed at night and uh, we took our shoes off and we put it down on the floor. And as the ship started getting tossed by the waves, all these shoes went sloshing from one end to the other and getting up next morning was almost impossible to find your shoes. It was all mixed up together. When we got off the ship, they put us on buses and the bus had to go through Manhattan. And we never saw buildings like that. From the bus, we couldn't see the top of them. We almost lay down on the floor of the bus trying to look up so we could take a glimpse of the top of these buildings. And we were all kind of laughing and, and joking about it, saying, ah, oh, look at this, how would you like to climb the stairs up there? We didn't even know they had elevators. It's both scary and also hopeful at the same time. I didn't know what will await for me, but I knew that it could not be worse than I had before. I had no idea where I was, what I was doing. Remember that I did not have a normal childhood. I was not playing in a kindergarten at four and five. I was running and hiding and escaping throughout Eastern Europe with parents and on a ship. I do have a memory of the ship because I was very seasick. I definitely remember being on the deck and my mother and father screaming that I should be careful or I'm going to fall off because I ran around a lot. There were about 550 other refugees on that ship. When we arrived in New York City, the Hayas office that sponsored us put us into a shelter and they contacted my aunt in Chicago that we were in America, that we had arrived safely. She then came to get us and took us to Chicago, to her home. And that was the beginning of our new lives in America. My father kissed the ground that he was in a free America, an America where there wouldn't be any more hatred against Jews or anti-Semitism or bigotry. I found out that I had an uncle in Brooklyn and uh, I wrote to him. He sent me the, 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 the proper papers to apply for a visa to come to America. When I came here, I was still sick. And I wasn't too, actually, I was not too happy. I was not too happy because I had no friends. After uh, I, I went to school, I learned a trade, I went into business, and uh, 
uh, I, uh, I was already about 20 years old, and then I started to get interested in ladies, and I, and I met a lady, a very nice lady. I wanted to, to have a family. I, I met her, and about three months later, we got married. Uh, I didn't waste much time. She was a lovely, lovely lady. They came and took my name and asked me if I have family in the United States. I said, yes, I have an aunt and an uncle that I knew because I didn't know them, but I knew the uncle's name because it was the same as mine. They gave it to the Jewish newspaper in New York and the radio station, and they announced every morning, every afternoon, the names that people that are coming. So one guy heard it, and he knew my uncle from home. So he calls him there. He says, David Mermelstein is looking for the, his uncle, David Mermelstein. He said, that must be my brother's son. When I got to the United States, we couldn't be happier. It was awesome. I can't describe how I feel about having met uh, David Mermelstein and Dr. Miriam. I learned a lot from him and how he's so strong and able to overcome his past. Just this can happen to anyone. We're all the same person, no matter what our skin color is or what our beliefs are. The Holocaust happened because of bigotry, prejudice, hatred of the other, and anti-Semitism. I feel like there's a lot to learn from the Holocaust. Now I have the knowledge that I didn't have before. We need to like learn about it so that history doesn't repeat itself. Your generation has a responsibility to make sure that this first is not forgotten and second, that it's never repeated again. Uh, talking to Laszlo because it was, it was interesting, it was very interesting. It went pretty good. We got interesting stories out of them and overall it was emotional and heartbreaking. You should think how you can make the world better because if nothing is done, we're going to blow ourselves up either by bombs or, or by hating people. There's a lot of hate, hatred out there and with learning, we can help abolish that. And so people don't suffer anymore through racism and anti-Semitism. Nothing good comes out of hate. The only way forward, really, is by love. And you are the ones who have to teach this to everybody around you. I honestly think that the key to peace is love. We should learn from the past and make the future better. I think we can learn how to treat people and how not to treat people. When I spoke to some people and I started talk, telling them my story like I'm telling you, they said, forget about it. For, that was Germany. Forget about it. And I said, how can I forget? I watched my mother taken to the gas chamber. You can't forget it. Yeah, I'm very proud of my, of my parents who gave life to a person who could live so nicely now. If you could speak to your parents today, what would you say to them? How sorry I am that I don't have them. And to them, the children, my brothers, sister, Yeah, it's something you can forget. I would tell them how happy I am. I have three children, three grandchildren, and a great-grandson, and I enjoy them every week. <laughs>